Thank you for joining today on our webinar uh, on H-2A and H-2B visas and, uh, and the updates that we'll be providing. Um, we want to make sure that we are able to answer your questions. So please go ahead and put any questions you have in the Q&A and we'll answer them at the end of the uh, session. For our legal disclaimer, this of course does not constitute any legal advice. It's all information purposes only. Um, if you'd like any um, consultation, please feel free to reach out to any one of us. Our contact details will be provided at the end of the PowerPoint. And this uh, slide deck will also be sent out to those who uh, registered for the webinar. So just a little bit about WR Immigration. Um, we are a immigration firm that practices solely on business-based, employment-based, family-based, um, and investor type of visas. Um, we're also available to do any sort of litigation oriented immigration. Um, we provide high touch service and innovative technology. If you wanna learn a little bit more about our firm, please visit our website and subscribe to our blog. And I'm Sharina Garcia. I'm a partner here at WR Immigration located in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'd like to have our panelists introduce themselves. So Melissa, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Melissa Harms. I'm also a partner with WR Immigration in the San Francisco Bay Area. I've been practicing immigration law for over 20 years. And here in San Francisco, we do a lot of work with the hospitality and wine industry. So this is particularly relevant to my clients. My name is Jesterlyn Emralino, and I am an attorney at WR based out of our Oakland office. Um, I have been in the field of immigration for almost 22 years, um, 10 years working as a paralegal and the remaining 12 as an attorney. My name is Bob Birak. I've been practicing immigration law for the past 44 years. I'm out of Detroit. I'm not a part of WR. I'm actually like a redheaded stepchild of WR, but we work closely on the H2Bs and H2As. We love Bob. Bob is part of the family. <laughs> so with that, why don't we go ahead and start talking about the H2B and Melissa, can you kind of give us an overview of the H2B? Of course. So as some of you may or may not be aware, the H2B, we're going to start with H2Bs and we'll move to H2As afterwards. But this is a non-agricultural worker visa for temporary work. And some of you might be familiar with H1B, which is very uh, popular in the immigration world. Um, this is a little different from the H-1B, but like the H-1B, we have a limited number of H-2B visas. Um, the key component of this is it allows workers to come here to perform temporary non-agricultural work. And it might be one-time seasonal peak load or intermittent. And we'll get to those in a minute, what, those, um, what that actually means. So we have 66,000 um, H-2Bs and they're broken down into two halves a year. So it's a little different from the H-1B. Um, the first half um, is from October to March, and we can start registering in July. And the second half is from April to September, and we register in January. Melissa, when, uh, are the, when is the um, H-2B cap normally reached? Well, you know, like I said, this is better than the H-1B. It's not reached on the first day where we have, <laughs> we have like 10 times the amount of people applying. Um, this year, let's see, we were, I think we reached the, uh, the cap in uh, November. No, I'm sorry. Uh, we reached the cap in September this year, um, and we started falling in July, so we did have sufficient time. The year before that was actually November, so it was a, lo a lot longer the year before. And then the second half, where we could start falling in January, we reached it about we reached on February 12th. There are additional visas that were re released on May 18th, um, so we were able to supplement the, the numbers this year uh, for people who missed out on that first half with an additional 35,000, uh, which has come in handy for some of our employers. Great, thank you. So some of the industries utilizing H2B workers, um, these are the top, these top industries, resort, hospitality services, um, retail sales, landscaping, food servicing, processing, and construction. So typically, and there, we'll talk a minute about the, um, the different types of need, but typically this is something um, that can be done, that is done on a seasonal basis, although there are other um, uses of the program, but seasonality is, is one of the key things we see, um, especially here in San Francisco. Okay, who qualifies for H2B uh, classification? So to qualify, the, we, the employer has to show that there's not enough US workers who are able to do the work, um, willing, qualified, and available. 
Um, and, and they also, the employer also has to show that these um, workers are not going to adversely affect the wages of the U.S of the US worker or the US, the working conditions. Um, these first two prongs are governed by Department of Labor and there is a very, uh, there's a very prescribed uh, system, a very regulated system for proving that shortage, um, which Jess will get to a little later on. Um, and then the third showing, and this is where we get to uh, show our lawyer stripes, is showing that the, the prospective worker's services are temporary. So that's um, a big part of this uh, application is showing the temporary need of, of the seasonal work or the the staffing shortage. Okay, so this is kind of the, the meat of the um, temporary need slide. So there's four different types of ways you can show um, a, temporary, a temporary need. So it can be a one-time occurrence, seasonal that we talked about, a peak load or intermittent. Um, so going through those, and you know, this seems, it seems a little difficult to understand what those are. So the one-time occurrence, um, giving you an example of a one-time occurrence, this might be um, this is a, a, you know, this is a, a situation that's permanent, but a temporary event has occurred. Um, and this is where the, the employer hasn't um, had, the, the um, employer hasn't employed workers in that occupation in the past, and it won't be them again in the future. So one of the examples that um, the USCIS actually provides for this occurrence would be, um, let's say a toy um, or a production manager for a new product is coming to the US and he needs to train he or she needs to train workers in the US to install that product. And the, the workers employed in the UK, and they usually have uh, this need in the UK, but they're coming here for a short one-term example. Um, so that would be an example of a one-time occurrence. The seasonal need, like I said, this is probably one of the most common needs we see. And this is where the employer has to show that the need is tied to a season of the year, and that event is recurring. So um, an example of a seasonal need, we, you know, the ones you can think about, the ski resorts in the Rocky Mountains are here locally up in Tahoe, um, Cape Cod, any kind of uh, dining staff in Cape Cod during the summer season, um, lifeguards. Um, and then what we see with the, with the wine industry is some kind of non-agricultural worker, let's say a seller hand or some, uh, one of the, some of the employers or some of the occupations where it is a seasonal need, maybe it's not out picking the grapes, but it's in the production facilities um, and it's dictated by the seasons of the year. So a peak load need, um, this would be a, this would be an example, let's say you have a toy manufacturer who makes a new product. Um, I can fill in the blanks for my kids, you know, the whatever that new hot product is for the year and they have an un, you know, unprecedented need and they, need, they might need to have people come in to help at the assembly line over Christmas season. That would be um, kind of peak load need there. Um, for the peak load, you have to show that you regularly employ the, the permit workers, um, but it's the, the supplemental workers are due to short-term uh, short demand. And those temporary workers are not gonna be part of the regular oper operation. And so lastly, the intermittent need, sorry, one more, <laughs> just going through the examples really quickly. The intermittent need might be something like a, um, this, is, this is where the employer has to show it's not, it has not employed permanent or full-time workers in the, um, in the past. And this is to um, just occasionally or intermittently uh, use these workers. So an example might be a sports jersey manufacturer who needs to do some sweatshirts around the Super Bowl or you know, major sporting events. Um, another one would be like, we talked about a log, um, uh, sometimes logs get uh, start floating in the water and they need these certain types of trained people to come in to extract the load, the logs out of the water. And that was an example um, of an intermittent need where they have to train these people just to come in to pull the logs out of the water every once in a while. Okay, with that, and that was a lot of information, I'm moving quickly because we have a lot of slides. I'm gonna turn it over to Jess, who's gonna talk you through the, the H2B process. Hey everyone. Um, so the H2B process is a multi-step process. Um, we're dealing with three government agencies basically in order to go, get through the multi-step process. And the initial stages we would have to deal with the Department of Labor in order to get through the H2B registration period and the labor certification process. So just going on step one here, which is the prevailing wage, um, this is the initial step of the process. Prior to this, there has to be a conversation with the company regarding the need that they have. 
right? So we have to identify the job. What are the job duties? What are the requirements for the position? Um, and that information will need to be submitted to the Department of Labor in order to obtain a prevailing wage determination. So the prevailing wage determination will advise the company of the required wage for that job that they are seeking for that temporary worker. Um, takes about six weeks um, in order to get that prevailing wage determination and you must have a valid prevailing wage determination by the time that you get to step three, which is registration. And so it's very important to start early, okay? Um, moving on to step two here, which is the job order. Okay, the H2B process requires that the company place a job order with a state workforce agency, okay, specific to the work location of the job. Um, that job order that will be placed with a state workforce agency will provide information with regards to the offered wage, um, information regarding the position, the benefits that are um, associated um, with being offered for that specific um, position. So that has to be taken care of uh, before one is able to move forward to step three, which is the registration. So registration occurs um, generally twice, as, as Melissa had, had noted. Um, the first one um, is in January. So it's actually a three-day filing period, January 1 to 3. And then the second one occurs um, in July. So it's the 4th of July weekend. It's, it's usually July 3, 4, and 5. Okay. And so during that um, step, okay, the ETA form 9142B has to be submitted with the government. It's submitted through FLAG, which is the, the government's um, platform. Um, you have to indicate the prevailing wage determination that has been received with the government, um, list down the, the case number, the, the wage assessment that has been provided by the government. Um, you have to indicate that a job order has already been um, in place. And what happens is that during that three-day filing period, right, where attorneys are scrambling to file these registrations, um, they'll close out that filing period. And then thereafter, what they do is that they will go through a randomization process, okay? They go through a randomization process and basically assign a group assignment to those individuals who submitted the registration. The reason that they do that is that there's more people who want to register then there are numbers that are available. So just to give you an example, last January of, of this year, so for individuals, um, for workers that have, a, a, a companies that have a need with an April 1 start date, right? Um, the Office of Foreign Labor Certification received 7,875 H2B registrations requesting 136,555 worker positions. Now, you have to remember, there are, there are only 33,000 slots available. So 136,555 slots, and they can only fill 33,000. So it really is a, a, a race to the finish. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's important to get a, a, a group assignment that belongs to group A. Um, they go all the way through group E, group A, group B, group B, D, and C. And so the earlier... Um, your, your group assignment is, um, that allows you to move forward to step four faster, okay, because you are in the priority group. So moving on to step four, um, if um, following the, the assignment um, um, that has been issued by, by the government, um, you will be allowed to move forward with the recruitment process. Um, what will happen is there's going to be a notice of acceptance. Um, you will be allowed to conduct recruitment. Um, there will be a recruitment that will be posted at seasonaljobs.dol.gov. The company will be asked to uh, post a notice of filing. So the notice of filing has information regarding the position, um, the, the salary, um, information regarding the, the numbers of hours to work, number of days to work, et cetera. There will also be a job order. So the job order that was st started in step two will continue on and will, re will remain open for the duration of the recruitment period. Employers will also be required to contact former employees in order to notify them that there is a requisition, there is a job order that is in place, as well as to recruit, um, recruit them if they're interested in coming back. 
Step five requires the company to uh, prepare a recruitment report. So um, council will be assisting the company in preparing this. The recruitment report will have information regarding the recruitment resources that were used um, during step four, listing the recruitment activity, the results of recruitment, um, how many US workers had applied, the disposition of the, the um, review of resumes and referrals, um, as well as confirmation that the company had contacted former employees. Now, you submit all of that information to the government, you submit your recruitment report to attest that you've done what is required of the company in terms of the recruitment. And step six then would be certification. So if the Department of Labor um, agrees and everything is in compliance with regards to the information that you've submitted to the government, the anticipation is that the government will issue a certification for the, the position that, you know, that we're, we're trying to secure, okay? Once we get a certification from the government, um, you will then take that certification and then move on and file the I-129 petition with USCIS. So here we're dealing Jess, with- can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. Um, if I need workers in the summer, when do I need to start step one? If you need workers in the summer, I'd say you need to get started at least six months in advance um, because before we even get to step one, there needs to be discussion that occurs, right? Strategy that needs to be in place with regards to the job, what standard occupational code is go, uh, going to be used, whether there is an anticipation of a prevailing wage issue, what the requirements are, um, whether the company has the, the required evidence in order to show the temporary need. So there's a lot of back work that needs to be done before you even get to step one. So if I, I need to register in January, I should be reaching out to the attorney in October, January. September, when? Six months prior, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. So moving on to step seven here, filing the I-129 petition with, with USCIS, you take that certification, you submit it to the government, you know, provide supporting documentation regarding the company. Um, you know, that includes the IRS letter assigning the federal employer, employer identification number, annual report, um, recent tax, tax return, um, profit and loss statement, spreadsheet showing permanent and temporary jobs hired um, in order to evidence peak load need, corporate information regarding the company's history, product services, et cetera. You submit it along with the filing fees. So filing fees is 460 for the I-129, 150 for the anti-fraud fee, and then premium processing, which you would want to do because it's a race to the finish again is 1,500. And so assuming that the government does not issue a request for evidence and all of your paperwork are intact, the anticipation is that you are going to get an I-129H to be approval notice, okay? And so that H to be approval notice, your workers then can take that to the US embassy in order to move forward with step nine, which is the visa application. So they need to get a visa sticker in their passport, an H2B sticker, in order to enter the United States. Um, they will make an appointment at the US Embassy, um, pay the necessary fees. Um, once they get their visa um, sticker in their passport, then that would allow them to enter the United States. So Jess, when do I have to identify my workers? Um, you should try to identify them as, as soon as possible. If you're working with, with a recruiter, that has to be dis disclosed at the beginning of the process. Um, and so those are conversations that definitely need to occur with, you know, with, with counsel. Okay. Um, but you don't need to list the, the names of the, the workers on step seven if you don't have them. Um, and so. I so mean, I need it by step nine, essentially. Yes. Exactly. I must have the names and all the workers identified by step nine. Exactly. Okay, thanks. We have 10 more minutes. So let's run through the employer obligations. Okay, so payment of required wages. Um, as I indicated, you have to get a prevailing wage determination from the government. So that prevailing wage determination, so when you submit the, the job duties, the requirements, the location, et cetera, with the government, and in turn, the government provides you with information as to how much should this worker be getting paid. Um, the offered wage must equal or exceed the highest of the prevailing wage that you get from the government or the federal, state, or local minimum wage specific to that job, okay? Um, the employer must pay the offered wage during the entire period of employment, 
okay? The, the wage rate must be met free and clear without unauthorized deductions or kickbacks from the employer. This means that if an employer is paying for housing and deductions will need to be made on the worker's paycheck um, as part of the housing arrangement, this must be, must be, must be disclosed during the application process. Okay, it's on the job order that you list it on the registration application. It's on the notice of filing. So there is a, you, you have to disclose it. Disclosure is mandatory. Okay, the employer must pay at least every two weeks or whatever the prevailing frequency is in, in the geographical area as well. Okay, and then Bob's gonna talk about the job hours and the three-fourths guarantee. Sure, I just wanna follow up on what Jess said about the <clears throat> payment of wages. One thing you got to be very careful of is that you stay in your lane. If you're hiring painters, helpers, don't give them a paintbrush. There's a difference of $12 an hour in the pay scale. What happens is wage an hour will come after you. If, they, if that worker works one day painting walls, you now have to pay him $12 an hour in back wages for every hour he's ever worked or is going to work. Same thing if you've got landscapers, uh, they are limited duties. They have to do the duties that are in the job description. You've got them building uh, masonry walls or patio surrounds or anything uh, like that, that involves masonry. Now you've got to pay them as a mason, not as a landscape worker. Now, uh, going on to the job hours, uh, these jobs uh, full time is considered 35 hours per week. And uh, these are temporary positions. It's throughout the length of period that you need the workers. So you need them from uh, April 1st through November 30th each year. Uh, good, at least up here in the north, that's what uh, we usually have for our landscapers. So that you have to guarantee that you're uh, going to give these workers three-fourths of the time, uh, the hours that are available during that period from April 1st to November 30th. This means that if you don't have work for them for any reason, uh, and you've got them sitting on the bench or staying at home not working, you still have to pay them for three-fourths of, uh, three of the hours. Now, if they're working 60 hours a week for a couple of months, and then you have a, a month where they're only working 20 hours a week, they'll still meet the three-fourths guarantee because the overtime hours also count uh, toward that three-fourths. But I don't want to get into too much detail there, but this obligation begins on the first day they uh, arrive and ends either at the, the end of the period or if, uh, if, if there's something happens, uh, there's a natural catastrophe, or uh, say something like a COVID situation uh, where you have to terminate their uh, services early, you can get permission from the Department of Labor to terminate the services, and that limits your exposure, uh, you know, for the uh, the wage uh, guarantees. And then employers are also. If we move to the next slide. Uh, your employers have to uh, make all deductions required by law. Those are your taxes, uh, you know, withholding, anything that's required by the state. Uh, anything that you're withholding is not required by law has to be disclosed in both the job order and the, uh, the applications, and it has to be reasonable. Now, deductions for expenses that are for the primary benefit of the employer are not considered reasonable. And that will reduce the, uh, the wages that you're paying to the employees and could bring the wage below the H2B uh, minimum wage rate. That happens, you've got wage an hour coming after you for uh, back pay plus penalties and interest. And it's very, very important to play by the rules with the uh, Department of Labor and Immigration Service with the H visas because the violations are very, very expensive and can range from anywhere from a few thousand dollars to uh, over $10,000 per violation per worker, in addition to back wages and possible debarment from the program. So you wanna be uh, very careful about that. Um, one of the things, one of the deductions that's for the benefit of the employee is housing. You're out there in California, housing's at a premium. So if you have, say you, you, you own a couple of apartments and you're going to put some, uh, some of your workers into the apartments, you have a right to deduct a certain amount for the, uh, you know, the rent and for room and board, uh, you know, as long as it's reasonable. And reasonable means, you know, what is the normal rate that would be charged if they had to do this on their own? They would not get four workers and they would normally pay $2,000 for an apartment you're deducting 500 a month from their uh, wages to pay for their apartment, that's reasonable. 
but it's not a money-making opportunity. You can't charge them a thousand dollars a piece. Then you're going to be, if you do that, then uh, it's excessive. And the, with the extra money is going to be charged against the wage rate you're paying. It's going to bring you below the minimum. You have to provide all the tools, uniforms, and other equipment that's required to uh, you know, for the jobs. And then transportation. You have to get the workers to uh, uh, to your place of business. So you're responsible for the round trip transportation, wherever they're coming from, inside or outside of the United States, and to return them there. Uh, you pay for the, uh, you know, if, if they, sorry, if they, are terminated for cause, they don't show up for work or they disobey the rules and they're fired, you don't have to pay for the outbound transportation. Uh, but you are responsible for, if you lay them off because of lack of work or something like that, you terminate early, you do have to pay for their uh, return trip. Uh, one thing to note though, is if they're leaving you to go to another employer, then the transportation becomes the obligation of the new employer. You don't have to pay to send them to your competitors or someone who's going to be employing them during the season. You're not employing them. And then there's always certain visa fees that are paid at the border for the visa application fee, border crossing fees, things such as that. You're responsible to reimburse the workers for those as well. And as far as place of intended employment and the job classification, the place of intended employment is where you're located. And the area of intended employment is considered to be anything within com commuting uh, distance. Now, if your workers are coming to your place of work, but you have other work sites, you're responsible for transporting them to and from the other work sites. You see that a lot with landscapers. They report in in the morning, they jump on the trucks and they're going from, uh, you know, from site to site to take care of their duties. Um, now, the other thing is, and again, this goes back to what I was saying before about staying in your lane, is uh, you cannot uh, look at uh, workers work in positions that they're not certified for. Uh, you know, if you've got landscape workers, you can't have them driving everybody, all the other landscapers around. You've got to get a driver for that. If you, if they, you get caught with your landscape workers, uh, serving as, uh, as drivers or uh, chauffeurs, then uh, the Department of Labor is going to come back and say you didn't treat U.S. Uh, workers fairly because you had available, a job available for a driver and didn't advertise it. And maybe the pay scale is different. You run into that problem where you could end up paying uh, back wages. So it's, it's uh, something where you have to adhere by the rules very carefully. They do enforce these uh, rules and regulations very, very strictly. And uh, especially, um, you know, you see it a lot, uh, you see it a lot in the I-9s as well as H-2As. And now they're starting to do this with the H-2Bs as well. And it's not uncommon at all to see uh, fines and penalties in excess of 100,000 and even more. Yeah, thanks, Bob. So we, we talked about the H-2B, and now we want to talk about the H-2A, because there's a lot of confusion about what's an H-2B, what's an H-2A. So Bob's going to run through the H-2A process. Okay. Now, yeah, the H-2A process is for agricultural workers. Uh, we had a question come in whether um, well, the winery workers would qualify for an H-2B. That's a good example. The answer is yes, if they're working in the bottling plant or they're, uh, you know, they're doing labeling or they're doing warehousing, that's H2B. But if they're out there working in the field, planting the vines, trimming and uh, you know, doing the harvesting, doing the fertilizing, that's H2A. H2A is for any kind of uh, agricultural labor, um, you know, whether it's uh, for raising livestock, uh, growing produce, uh, it even extends uh, with certain limited exceptions to things like cider pressing, but it it's, takes you from putting the, uh, you know, the product into the ground, harvesting, and then delivering the product uh, you know, to uh, an end source. Uh, it can include uh, some packaging for delivery to the end source, <coughs> but it's best to consult with an attorney to determine what is agricultural work and what is not, because the lines do get blurred in certain cases. 
You can raise animals for a petting zoo. You can raise show horses. You can breed them. That's agricultural work. Taking the, you know, running the uh, petting zoo or, you know, uh, training the horses for the show horse, uh, the shows, that's non-agricultural work. Uh, HUAs are used a lot in the, uh, the racehorse industry. And again, the lines do get blurred. Now, timelines for an H2A are somewhat different. We still like to get started six weeks in advance because there's a lot of preliminary work that can be done. You have, you have to provide housing. You need to get your housing certified. We have to get a good understanding of what the job duties are, make a determination of whether they're agricultural or non-agricultural and prepare all the forms and everything in advance because you only have, you can only file no sooner than 75 worker, sorry, 75 days before you need the workers on site and uh, you want to get the, uh, you want to be able to file your uh, labor certification within 45 days of meeting them on site. So it's a very, very uh, small window. The temporary need is basically a seasonal need because it is agricultural. Sometimes you get uh, certain things, certain farmers that there's farms that do run year round, dairy farms, ostrich farms, things like that. Uh, now, so there may be cases too where there's a peak load need. Maybe you run a farm where uh, you need extra, you have a full-time staff year round that can take care of everything. But when it comes time to planting and harvesting, uh, you know, all of a sudden you need an extra couple dozen workers to come in and help you with that. So that's the peak load need. It's not really a one-time need, although we've used one-time need. Now we had an ostrich farmer who had a stroke and they had to get someone in to run the farm while he was recuperating. So very, very similar to an H2B in that uh, regard. Um, the initial step is to file an agricultural clearance form with the Department of Labor, basically sets forth the working conditions, jobs, benefits, and shows all the worker protections that are mandated by the Department of Labor. They'll review this and uh, you get like a 15 day window between 75 days to 60 days before you need the workers on site. If uh, the Department of Labor sees any uh, deficiencies, they will issue a notice. You've got five days to respond. We can do it electronically, usually the same day. <laughs> and the purpose of that is to test the U.S. job market to make sure it's uh, the office fair to U.S. workers and you're not uh, trying to discourage U.S. workers. So the wage requirements for the H-2A are slightly different, whereas for H-2B, you look at the prevailing wages set by the Department of Labor and you're stuck at level three. For H2A, it's, uh, you can use level one wages, but you still have to pay the greater of the state minimum wage, the level one wage, or the adverse effect wage rate. That's the wage rate at which the government has determined that U.S. workers' wage rates will be adversely affected if you drop below that. And of course, if it's a union job, there's not many, uh, but if it's a union job, you have to pay union scale. Now there are additional employer costs involved with the H-2A that are not you know, involved with the H-2B. Uh, the, one, the one big difference is the round trip transportation. You have to reimburse them for the transportation, but only if they complete at least 50% of the period of employment. If they leave early, uh, they're paying their own uh, travel expenses. Uh, you're responsible, just like for the H-2Bs, for food and trial hotel expense to and from the work site. So if they're coming up from Mexico and it's a two-day trip and they have a hotel expense, you, you have to pay them at least uh, or up to $59 a day for food expenses if they keep their receipts, $14 a day without receipts, and for a reasonable hotel. So if you put a few couple people to a room, you put them up for a hotel for 120 a night, that's, uh, you have to pay that. You're also responsible uh, for payment of those expenses when you return them home. Now, what happens after the agricultural clearance form has been accepted is you now file the application for temporary labor certification with the Department of Labor. That's usually about 45 days before the start of employment. They'll either accept or uh, give you notice of deficiency. Within seven days, you've got five days to respond and correct the deficiency. Uh, then when it's accepted, they tell you how and when to recruit. That's pretty simple because the state workforce agency, in most of your cases, CalJobs, 
they'll go ahead and post the uh, job order to seasonalworker.gov and then you have to post internal job notice at the place of business. Uh, if you've had U.S. workers filling the position during the last year, you have to contact them unless they were terminated or uh, they, uh, for cause or they quit on you. And then when that's done, you submit a recruitment result report to the government confirming that uh, you know, you've got uh, you know, hired uh, U.S. workers who responded or that none responded and ask for permission to hire your uh, foreign workers. And then uh, they will provide you, or you also have to provide certification from the house, your state housing authority, uh, which is running about six months behind in California, to show that the housing has been certified for the upcoming year and proof of workers' comp insurance for the year. And then so you get all that in, and then the Department of Labor will certify your application for labor certification. Then you can file the visa petition, just like you would for an H-2B. Except the difference is with the H-2B, if you want an answer back in two weeks, you have to pay an extra $1,500 for premium processing. For H-2A, it's automatically expedited. You'll get your answer back within a week to 10 days so that you can get your workers into the U.S. And of course, they have to apply for their H-2A visas uh, if the, wherever the local council, wherever U.S. council, wherever they're located. Um, and, uh, if they've had H-2A status in the past couple of years, they uh, may waive the interview requirement for them as long as they're not otherwise admissible. But if you try to leave a week or two to get your workers on site once the certification has been granted, sometimes if, if you do need interviews, it takes time to schedule them. Now your obligations, you have the obligation to provide not only housing, but meals. And if you're not providing meals, you have to make sure you've got a fully equipped kitchen and preferably a washer and a dryer. Uh, you also have to provide transportation to town uh, for, for at least the nearest grocery store. You don't have uh, laundry facilities to a laundromat once or twice a week for uh, personal shopping. <laughs> now, as I said before, if you have multiple work sites, we see this a lot in the wineries. You might have wineries spread out over a couple of counties. You've got to transport the workers to and from the worker site, work sites that don't cost to the worker. Now the uh, the tools and equipment, again, of the, of the job have to be provided to the worker. And beyond that, uh, let's see, I think we already covered the final steps. Um, but if you have workers who are inside the United States who are already working for another, uh, for another farm, and you want to bring them to your farm or to your winery or to your ranch, uh, you can uh, file for an application to change their status and extend their status. And the nice thing is that as soon as you file that, because they are already in that status, it's portable and they can start working for you right away. So with that. Uh, so Bob, can I ask you a couple of questions? Yeah. Sure. So M Melissa had mentioned that there was a quota for the H2B. Is there a quota for the H2A? Like, is no, it a race to the not, finish no. also? Not at all. And in fact, over the last seven years, we've seen them triple. They've paid about 200, well, let's see. <laughs> it's closer to about <clears throat> closer to 400,000 workers now, but a couple of years ago, they have gotten up, they had tripled the numbers from around 60, some 55,000 to 200,000. So it's becoming an ever uh, more increasingly popular program. Um, I guess there's a lot of hoops to jump through. There's a lot of tight timelines, but uh, it's, it's really beneficial. It's getting harder and harder to find U.S. workers to, you know, fill those jobs. So, you know, uh, Jess had mentioned in the, um, the, the fees, the filing fees, and she had mentioned um, for the USCIS fees, is that per worker or is that per petition application? No, it's, it's per application uh, for however many workers you're bringing in. Now, if you're filing different applications in different countries, you're bringing workers in from Mexico, Honduras, and El Salvador, that's three applications, that's three times the fees. I get it. But the filing fees are the same for all H visas, $460. There's an anti-fraud fee, that's $150. And for the H-2Bs, there's a $1,500 premium processing fee that you do not have for the H-2As. Oh, okay. And then, so H-2B, the premium processing fee is actually lower than any of the other like H-1B fees. 
right? Because that's usually twenty five. Yeah, the all other premium processing fees are twenty five hundred, but there's an exception for the H two Bs. And the fraud fee is also lower as well, right? Yeah, the fraud fee. Well, no, the fraud fee for both are uh, one hundred fifty dollars for the A's and B's, but for H ones and such, I believe the uh, L's uh, they're all five hundred dollars. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then in can you give us some examples of some that are considered agricultural workers that you've done versus some H2B skilled workers? Because we have some sure. questions vineyard about- work, No, yeah, vineyard workers. Uh, like I said, anybody we do, uh, dairy farmers, you know, people who, uh, you know, handle, uh, you know, breeding and uh, milking of cows, uh, you know, have, uh, what you call the uh, eggs, uh, poultry farmers, and basically anything to do with ranching and farming, beekeepers, um, anything that's, that's producing, that's, uh, you know, putting the food product or putting a uh, product into the food chain uh, that, you know, involves uh, the actual growing and production of food and of livestock. Now, you know, if, you, if you're, you've got a farm, you operate your own slaughterhouse, you know, breeding the animals, raising the animals, caring for the animals and such, that's all agricultural work. Slaughtering them and butchering them, that's not. <coughs> so same thing with tomato farmers. When it comes to in, uh, fruit farmers, growing it, raising it, harvesting it, and taking it to the processing plant is agricultural. Freezing it, canning it, and otherwise uh, packaging it, other than packaging it for, uh, for delivery. Like, uh, you know, if you're doing you're doing tomatoes and you're packaging them into plastic uh, packaging and shipping the uh, shipping everything already packaged, you know, to the wholesaler. That's agricultural, but uh, shipping the uh, just you know just you know to, uh, freezing products, freezing frozen fruits, for example, or canning uh, sauces or different types of vegetables uh, for resale. That's not agricultural. And again, that's where it's on a case by case basis. So you really need someone who's well-versed and uh, experienced in the H-2A uh, visa industry to help you work. Someone like you, right, Bob? Someone like you who's been doing it for 30, 35 years. <laughs> yeah. uh, 44, actually. Oh, the 44, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then just one question, because we always get this question. Should you list experience requirements? Well, not for the, uh, it's, it's very rare that you would have an experience requirement for an agricultural worker. Uh, the Department of Labor sets the uh, educational experiential requirements for each job. And most of these are listed as job zone two, which means uh, either little or no experience is really required. Um, the only experience we ever see is maybe special uh, ability. You might have to be able to lift 50 pounds or 75 pounds to you know, lift a uh, lug of grapes or, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a box of uh, cabbages or whatever, you know, to get them up onto the tractor, up onto the skid, whatever you're, you're, you're hauling. Uh, so there's little things like that, but educationally, experientially, there's really no experience required, but if you do have experience or do require experience, you know, again, that's something you need to go over with the lawyer when you're determining uh, the, what the job duties are going to be, whether it's H-2B or H-2A, um, you know, and it's also going to have an effect on the wage rate. Although, again, with H-2B, it's automatically at level three. Uh, there's only four levels, and level three is uh, second highest. So even if you do require some experience over and above the minimum, it's not going to bump the wage rate up. Okay. And then can you tell us about the new incoming legislation? Because we sure. heard like there's and again, and then that then again goes to the uh, to the H2 uh, H2As. The uh, it just uh, back to the wage rates, the adverse uh, effective wage rate for California right now, I think is $17.15 an hour. You have to pay at least that much for all your agricultural workers. <coughs> now, the uh, what's on the horizon is been on the horizon for a long time as far as uh, legislative fixes. Um, there's the Farm Modernization Act that actually passed through the House last March and got stalled in the Senate. And what that proposes to do is set up a form of a legalization program for people who are in the United States <clears throat> illegally. Maybe they've worked here as uh, H-2A workers in the past entered as visitors, they've overstayed their visas, 
So for that reason, they're removable from the United States, or maybe they're on temporary protected status, deport, deferred enforced, enforcement status. Uh, what the proposed legislation does, or one of the things it does, is sets up a new, um, they call it a CAW. I'm not sure what the C stands for, but it's something agricultural worker. And what this does is it uh, sets up a, uh, a program for anybody who's worked over 1,035 hours of agricultural labor during the two years prior to March 8, 2021. Uh, those people would be able to obtain this special CAW status and stay in the United States for up to five and a half years as agricultural workers and get their status extended. So there's a lot of agricultural workers here who have fallen into the illegal status, but it will help alleviate some of the shortage. The other things that this does, and the most important thing, is that it allows for a registration process similar to what the H-2B program is supposed to have, where the farmers will be able to register their businesses to show that they have an annual recurring need. And that way they don't have to go through as many, jump through as many hoops every year to prove that they have a temporary need. This was uh, part of the H-2B law, but it's never been uh, activated. But for the red people, for the farmers who are registered, the H-2A workers will now be portable. So they will have 60 days after their uh, H-2A status expires to find a new job with a new farmer so that they can just move from job to job to job without the farmers having to go through the process of <clears throat> renewing the H-2B or going through the H-2B application process every year. And so they're going to make it, uh, they're going to revise the, the way the uh, wages are calculated and uh, make sure they've got certain, uh, you know, just kind of take a look at the three four fourths guarantee to make sure that the program is fair for U.S. workers as well as foreign workers. I can't tell you what they're going to do yet uh, because nobody really knows. Uh, you know, there's no saying that, you know, the camel's a horse designed by uh, committees. So as Congress, you give them a thoroughbred and uh, you know, it enters into the process and what it's going to look like by the time it comes out of the process, uh, who knows, you know, if it makes it out of the process at all. But that's about all that's really coming up. There's also talk, a lot of talk about finding a way to include H2B with some of these uh, modernization plans. And the last thing is that while there's a lot of uh, stalling going on in Congress right now, there's bipartisan report for the Farm Modernization Act to try and get something done before the upcoming elections in November. They both sides of the fence recognize this is very important. Uh, the big holdup has been the, the southern border and uh, you know, not wanting to do any kind of uh, new immigration legislation until that issue is resolved. But it looks like they are there's a lot of strong support for making an exception to the Farm Modernization Act. Thanks, Bob, for sharing that. So um, our next slide is about our key takeaways. So Melissa, Jess, and Bob, can you kind of share some of the key takeaways that our, our participants should, should have from this session? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is that as immigration lawyers, we get contacted all the time saying, we've got a shortage, we've got a shortage, and we understand there's a shortage. But the H-2B in particular can't just be used for shortage, the need must be temporary. So that's a key thing to, uh, to point out. Um, and before Jess goes into planning early and plan ahead, I want to emphasize that this looks incredibly complicated, but we as your expert immigration team will make this not so complicated for our clients. So there are you know, there are a lot of steps to follow, um, as Jess pointed out, but um, that's our job to help you navigate the system and not make this seem like an onerous process um, or try to make it as easy as possible. Yeah, it's a, it can look uh, really complicated, but as Bob said, he's been doing it for 44 years. I think the one piece of advice I can give to you is just make sure the person working with us can work really fast because we're going to be sending you documents to sign and you have to just hustle and sign it because we are racing against the clock when it's an h2b um yeah, read, and then right, Jess, it looks very complicated but bob's been doing it for 44 years how complicated can it be 
Yeah, how complicated can it be? Because we have Bob here who has all the years of experience and he'll make it less complicated for you and easier to walk through down that path. So if it's your first time, of course, email us and we'll be able to help you. And Jess, what tips do you have for them? Um, plan early and plan ahead. Um, you know, planning is, is very important so that we can identify all of the required documentation. We could work with you um, with a strategy for the case. So, you know, the, the appropriate SOC code, for example, um, that must be used for the position to ensure that the job duties are aligned. We're getting that the wage um, that the company is able to accommodate um, based on the SOC, based on the work location. Yeah. So planning is everything, right? So that you can anticipate all of the possible issues. And if you plan ahead, then it's not going to be complicated because you know what you're up against. So if you have a need next year, you should be reaching out to us now. Is that planning ahead? Sure. Yes. Okay. Yes. And Bob, if it's an H2A, how early should they plan ahead? Six months before you need the workers on site. Okay. And then Bob, you want to tell us about the rules? Yeah, I just want to reiterate what Melissa said. I mean, uh, you know, we're basically like sausage. You know, you love the end product, but you don't need to watch it made. We're making it. You're eating it. So uh, bottom line is that, you know, we try to make this as easy as possible for you, but you have to understand that it is extremely complex. It's, uh, you know, it, and you have to understand and be willing to accept the risk. You're going to be spending money on legal fees and other fees uh, with the understanding, like as Jess said, there's only going to be 33,000 visas available and 140,000 people applying for them. So you got about a 30% chance of getting your visas the first time around, and you never know if they're going to issue additional visas. They did this year. But now you've got another 30% uh, will get theirs. So there is some risk involved. But, you know, you got to be you got to be fairly flexible because, you know, things don't always run according to schedule, getting the workers in. So I said, leave a week or two to make sure they're all able to get their interviews. We never know what the uh, lines are going to be like at the embassies. But one thing I cannot emphasize enough is play by the rules. Okay, don't let your workers uh, gee, just you know, do other jobs. Uh, when you're laying off uh, U.S. laying off workers, say you have a supply chain issue, you don't lay off your U.S. workers. You lay off your H-2A or H-2B workers. If you've got U.S. workers who can fill the job, if you don't, then those uh, U.S. workers are going to come back after you for uh, for back wages, and you're going to get nailed for uh, violating. You've got 12 workers. I had this happen here recently to somebody uh, in the Michigan area. He had uh, 12 workers laid off, uh, U.S. workers. They not only, he not only had to pay their back wages of about $60,000, but they hit him for, uh, I think it was close to $80,000 in penalties for the two weeks they were off. So, I mean, they, they, they don't uh, take, this, take kindly to people who they violate their rules. So, you got to be willing to play by them. Yeah. Well, we have some time for questions. So um, James, why don't you move to the next slide so people have questions we can't answer. Um, so one of the questions was, could an architect qualify for an H-2B visa? Anyone can chime in? Yeah, I could take care of that. Yeah, the answer is yes, of course they can. You know, now I would say, is it a possibility? Yes. Is it a probability? No. Uh, you'd have to be able to prove you've got a special uh, design project. You don't have a need for architectural uh, architects year round. And you have a special project <coughs> we need the services of an architect or at least an architect with specific skills <coughs> in a certain type of area to come in and fill that position for you for a period of time that has a specific start date and a specific end date. That would be a one-time need. To understand temporary need, as Jess was explaining, is it's not, or as Melissa was explaining, it's not that there's a temporary shortage of workers. It's that you have a recurring need for additional workers to supplement your U.S. workforce every year, or like in this case, a one-time need, or maybe it's intermittent. You know, you work for Bradford Exchange, and you got your World Series plates coming out, and then you've got your uh, your Stanley Cup plates coming out. So you have to get the workers in to make the plates a couple times a year. Thanks, Bob. And then Melissa or Jess, you can answer this. 
Do we assist people on finding a job offer or a company in need of foreign professionals to apply for these positions? We are not a recruiter. Um, and so we do not assist in, in, in that regard. Um, we could prefer provide referrals for, for recruiters. We do have a list for that and you could um, engage them, have discussions with them regarding recruitment efforts. And yes. there are recruiters who are set up designed for this process. So we can send you those, those names to work with. Yeah, and some states have certain requirements for the recruiters. So many of our clients will come to us, they don't have the workers identified we'll refer them to the recruiters and then they work with the recruiters. But we only help you with getting the paperwork through the government. We don't help you find workers. So just so you know that. Um, so my manufacturing company is very behind on on-time delivery and we get no responses from our hiring ads starting at 17 to $20 an hour. I, our needs to sustain our company is not temporary. We need permanent visa employees as an essential manufacturer of military cables for Department of Defense. Would this qualify as an H-2B? No, there has to be a temporary need. So it's not meant in order to fill permanent positions in the U.S. It's meant to fill a temporary need um, for yeah. temporary workers. And so the best thing to do is to call our office and let us walk you through what is defined as a temporary need. Um, and then we can give you examples of what would work as a temporary need um, and then explain to you what types of documentation you would have to provide to the government to prove that need. Okay. It's also an this option is a, to do it's a very factual. A permanent labor certification to bring them in for the long run, although right now there's no visas available for, uh, for unskilled workers. That's uh, now backlog. Yeah, I mean, Bob makes a good point. Like I work a lot with in the healthcare industry and like caregivers, you know, that is an unskilled um, position as well, but we actually have a path to get them a green card, which is a permanent, um, permanent uh, immigrant visa, but that takes a long time. You have to plan at least like three to five years or sometimes seven years before you'll have that worker. So there are paths to do that. Um, if experience is required, do we have to identify workers at the I-129 stage? I'll, I'll take the next two. Hey, Supin, how you doing? Supin's only a couple miles from me. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, experience, is it required? No, uh, you can if you, don't, you can just do unnamed workers. Even if you require experience, they can prove their experience at the consulate. And then in response to your second question, uh, which is at which stage do the workers count against the, the quota or the number on your uh, labor cert? It's uh, when they enter the country. So, for example, uh, this said landscaper, uh, he brought in six, re six returning workers and had uh, available room on his certification for two more. So we just found uh, we're bringing in two more now under the supplemental visa program using the same labor certification. Uh, you know, it's just uh, you can't stagger the entries, but if uh, the visas are simply not available and then become later, you can use the same labor certification. So I hope that answers your question. If not, uh, you know my number. <laughs> and I then, wanted to quickly go back to the factual, the, the question about temporariness. And, you know, one thing about uh, Bob and our, our office is, is structure, the way we structure these applications. So there are creative uses. So there might be a construction company that won't qualify in one instance, but they will if, for, if the facts are slightly different. So reach out to us for, it's a very fact-driven process as to whether the need is actually temporary. I think the one thing we didn't mention is I always get this question, can I bring workers from any country on the H-2B, Bob? Well, there's about 80 countries, maybe 82 now, I'm not sure, but there's, uh, if you just Google H-2B uh, countries, you'll get the list of countries uh, from which you can bring workers. Some countries are not, uh, not included or for a while the Philippines off the list because they had too many cases of the workers coming in and overstaying. So, uh, you know, they want to make sure the workers are all going back when they get done working. Okay, we have a, we're at time. Whoa, we're at time. It went by so fast. Thanks to all our great panelists. And I just give a quickie to Elvira Mendoza, who reached out earlier with a question. She had about uh, bringing workers in. She needs to know where, uh, you know, about uh, applying uh, for the uh, DS-160, the application for immigrant visas and that process. 
We use a fellow named Omar Santos. Uh, if you reach out to the firm, we'll give you his information. You can contact him. He takes care of it right there in Mexico. Yeah, there's Bob's email right here. So our contact information's here. Thanks to everyone for being part of this um, webinar. We hope you learned a lot of information that you can bring back and reach out to us if you have any H2 needs. Thank you to our panelists for joining.